The studio of Joseph Walsh in Riverstick County Cork is one of the great citadels for making and thinking about making anywhere in the world today. Joseph was born here on his family's farm and about 25 years ago he began to use it as a studio as well, making furniture, objects of his own imagination, his own creativity. Those objects became more and more extraordinary over time. It got to be a little hard to say whether he was making furniture or making sculpture, or maybe just drawing in midair. He was taking the recalcitrant materials and techniques of woodworking and transforming them into pure poetry. Over time, as his shop expanded, he began to attract other makers from around the world who shared his vision and had the skills to match. And as he learned, it also occurred to him that he was learning about making as an idea, making as a cultural force. He began to imagine an event, a gathering, that could bring people around the world together to think about the possibilities of craftsmanship and what it can offer to the world today. The result was Making In, an annual event where people come together and share their ideas, their stories, their objects, and ultimately think about not just the past, the traditions of craft, not just its present, but also the future, the future of making, the way that it can transform not just materials, but transform culture itself. Making is undergoing a real revolution at the moment. It's you know, a moment like I haven't experienced before. So many people are interested in it. So much creativity. And this really, on the global stage, is the single most impressive event devoted to the subject. There are people from all over the world, all different kinds of crafts, all different kinds of art form. And yet they share so much, they have a real commonality of interest, commonality of purpose. And I think Joseph Walsh is just so extraordinary in pulling them together. You're all very welcome. And it's great to have, uh, have so many of you back um, that have attended this event in the past and um, so many of you that are here for the first time, you're all very welcome. It's so rich to get creative people to a place of making, um, and I think it's a different type of conversation um, than, than the ones that we might have in institutions. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to those that have supported it. Uh, so we're here, of course, to celebrate making and what it brings to the world, what makers bring to the world. Uh, these figures uh, around us who we depend on, who we, who we love, whose work we love, and who bring so much meaning and conviction to what they do. And we're specifically talking about making in time. In the past, we've talked about other aspects of making, making in place, for example. Um, but today, we're going to be weaving in and out of this question of temporality. So we're not talking about time today in terms of just you know, the regular synchronous passage of seconds, minutes, days, weeks, months, years. We're talking about time as something perceived, something that has articulation, something that's personalized, deeply personalized and internalized. I was drawn to the craft by the ease with which willows could be grown. You simply plant willow cuttings into clear fertile ground in spring and they begin to grow. It has allowed us to live in a beautiful area and for myself to find a craft which has consistently engaged me. When you experience your material as a gift, I think it does change your attitude. Entitlement gives way to gratitude. I think one of the things that we think about when we think about craft, because we ourselves are makers of nothing, but thinkers of things, uh, is how we can bring it into a scale that can also be architectural. If there is a correlation between visual harmony and, and uh, you know, audio harmony, sometimes when you see something that's made well, 
uh, is designed well, and the wood is is what it is. It it you know you look at it and you can almost hear it singing. Uh, at least I do. Mm. <laughs> so the outside is to be covered in these enameled fig leaves, and when opened, inside is a bare tree where you can just throw your clothes over. And each leaf takes about 18 hours to make, to paint. And there's 616 leaves on the cabinet. <laughs> but all this has a combination of, um, of a kind of elegance and, and delicateness that comes from, from nature, which I'm very fond, fond of. They sent me an image of Coco Chanel's apartment and that was at the Ritz, where she had these kind of crazy boiserie, gilded boiseries, and they said, you know, make something like that. But, you know, so, um, and I said, okay, sure. And so that's what we came up with. But then it was great because then it became a prototype, and these are installed in Chanel stores in Rome, Madrid, Beijing, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, I believe. For me, drawing is, I mean, it's very simple to say that's what I do because it is all I do, but it's also inherently what fascinated me. So, and I, I still don't think I've quite got it, so I keep doing it. Mm. And drawing is, it's everything. You can be a sculptor, you can be a painter, you can be a fresco painter, can be all sorts of things, but you can't be an artist. An artist is something what you are. I want to pour my emotions into that material. We are both really interested in material, I mean the authenticity of material, how you use materials in such a way that exhibits their characteristics and that also that you can see the materials and that they uh, age gracefully over time. The closer we can get, or the closer we can stay between the material, the maker, and the thing itself, the happier we are. It's those timeless qualities that creators that we've met and heard about today brings to, to buildings. We see ourselves more as making places and, and, and not to hijack that word but we've been making places particularly the last decade around Dublin City and we've taken a lot of pride in that but also to promote the best in Irish design, best in craft making, best in architecture and weave all of those ingredients into the buildings that we create. I think it's key to reviving our cities but also key to making buildings and cities more about human beings. I'm interested in the hats of today and the hats of the future. I think, you know, we look so different to how we looked 50 years ago that I believe that there is potential for the head to be uncharted territory. Everything that happens has these consequences that if, if you're sort of alive a bit, you can aestheticize into interesting problems. I think the only contract with, with the world that an artist has is to show them something, which means that you can do anything you want. So, Ozaki-san, I would like to begin asking you about your work by asking you about the choice of material. ま、
ガラスで作る時もあったんですけど、うん、結局最後は金属に戻ってきた僕は大学の時にがあのその研究室の中でステンレスを叩くのは禁止だって言われてた。銅とか鉄は構わないんでステンレスは、うん、あの手首を痛めるんで,でまあでも僕はだったらステンレスを叩こうってその時に仲間はみんな言いますけどあのおかしいって<笑>でも付き合っていくとだんだんこう仲良くなれる and, and now that you have worked it for many years what is your relationship with the stainless steel become? 技術が進歩しましまたあの自分の情感を込めたいんですね例えば歌手が自分の感情をそこで舞台の上で表現するようにリアルな感情を作品に込めたいそのためにはどうしても技術が必要でした。I think this idea of technique as a means of making possible Is very important to think about. And this also seems to be a subject of many of your forms. So, the work that Wahei already mentioned with the steel almost touching the stone, and also this long series that you have created where the curve of the sculpture brings it around. Earlier this morning,、um, I think、uh, um, we had a discussion about、uh, a phrase in Japanese. That fleeting moment in time where you meet someone,、um, Ichigo Ichie,、yeah. the now and here.、Um, that work、um, that you saw is actually、um, two paths、um, one path in life, another path in life, and they're finally about to meet for the first time.、Mm. And it's that exhilaration, that tension, that and exhilaration of finally meeting the person you've always wanted to meet for the first time.、Mm. Um, that's the name of the work actually. It's called Ichigo Ichie,、yeah. or、um, Here and Now. Here and Now. now、yes. yeah, yeah. And he made it for me, and、um, specifically the two paths that we had,、mm. and finally that we are about to meet in that excitement that he had at the time, he tried to capture、mm. in that work. Mm. Mm. So it's about that story of you, you encountering Wahei san,、um, and yet it's also a story about. The artwork itself. It's almost for me as if the art is trying to find itself. I was drawing a little bit of a drawing, and I was drawing a l i t t やはり最,最後のこれですね平面に書いてるんだけど心の中では筆は紙の奥へ行ったりしてで結局その動きっていうものが自分の人生の紆余曲折を経てその宇宙空間で小さな石と石がコツッと出会う。たぐらいの奇跡によってあのそこで出会うことができた喜び今日の,あの皆さんとの出会いも多分そうだと思うんですけど自然の営みそのものだと僕は思っています時間の経過っていうのはつまり素材の変質を引き起こす鉄が錆びたりとか私たちがを追いさせてしまったりとか。でそれを私は止めることができないんですよねその自分の力ではどうしようもできないことつまりその自然の営みっていうものは僕がどうあがいても思う通りにはできないその自分の弱さっていうものを自覚した時にあのこれはものを作る上ですごく大事なことだと思ってるんですけど恐れの感覚自然に対する畏敬の気持ちそれを自分で自覚できた時に初めてその
謙虚になれるっていうことと純粋になれる、うん、でこのことをすごく大切に考えて作っていますそれとあの時間っていうものを止めることができないってさっき言いましたけど時間っていうものを感じられるっていうのはあの過去っていうのはもうやり直しができない未来はまだ来てないってことは何かできるとしたら今しかない今っていうのは絶え間なく今で川の流れのように次から次へと新しいそれが今ですよね。As you mentioned earlier today, Glenn,、um, it's the flow of time like rivers. You cannot step into the same river twice, but it, you're, it's always now. It's flowing, it's now. Flowing, it's now.、うん、で僕はそのある時川,あの川の前にいて目の前を流れている川の水をじっと見てて今を捕まえようと思ったんです。And he was standing in front of a river actually and wishing to capture time. でまさに今だと思って川の,川の水に手を突っ込んで手のひらをこう見てみたら水が全部指の間からこぼれ落ちてもうそこには今がなかったんですよ、ね。And when he was in front of the river, he said to himself, Now! And he Grabbed the river, the water in the river, and tried to hold it in his hands. But already the water was falling out of his hands.、Um, the now is not there anymore. So, I think that the water is falling out of his hands. So, since he couldn't capture it with his hands, he said, Why, I might as well jump into the river. そしたら、ああ、今、なあ、いつ、なあ、なあ、なあ。そう、ひめにジャンプで、ひプランジで、なあ、ひ、really felt like he was drowning。そう、ひ、ます。で、この実験というのは、もう皆さんも、あの、簡単にすることができて。今日帰ったら、あの、シャワーの水を。浴びてみてください。and he's、um、saying that this little experience experiment。Everyone could try at home <laughs> <laughs> with a simple shower. <laughs> so please try it when you go home today.、Hmm. Excellent. Let us know how that goes. さっきの,の今の話とまたかあの同じになってしまうんですけど作品がそこにあって鏡面があるとどの時代例えば今,今日でも来年でも10年後でもその時にその作品を見てくれた人の今が作品に投影されるだからどこに持って行っても森の中でもこの部屋の中でもその時の今をそこに投影できる、so、そういう素晴らしさが。Let me just ask one question in conclusion of Azaki san if I might. I wonder what his impressions are of this place and this day that we have had together. Making it. Nanka Mada, Kuchuni Ukande, Hokori no Yona Kibu. I feel like dust floating in air. I'm still floating in air. 帰って1週間ぐらいしたら、どうすればよかったかが。And perhaps after a week has passed, then he could reflect and think, that, and think what he could have done better. But it's very much like a dream that he's living right now. <laughs> Uh, I would like you to first tell us, casting your mind back, how did you first become an artist? How did that occur? What, what, what began it for you? Well, I would say, with, almost with my birth, since I can talk, my father was a writer, art critic, 
and also he wrote a book on sculpture. Mm. And if you have that sort of background, we went as small children with him to all before the war, of course, uh, to museums. We went to uh, um, churches. And you can imagine the life in Germany, especially before bombing and all, was full of wonderful things. And my parents, they knew each other before the, long before the war, before they were married, I think, even. And uh, Hempel was his name. And, um, and Hempel got, a le got a letter from the Irish family who he was very friendly with and then also from my father. Anyway, um, they had a son who was going to be an, art, a voice, an artist, going to be at the art school. And he would like to go to Germany and learn wood carving and sculpture. Yeah. And my father had the same with his daughter. My eldest, I, he had my eldest, I was the eldest daughter. And so that's why I came to Ireland. Mm. And we lived in Glendalough. I don't know any Irish people know Glendalough, of course, County Wicklow. And these are all early, but that's the great golden age of Ireland mm. in 800, 600, 800, mm. until 1000, really. Mm. Before all the, the time of the Vikings, of course, too. But there were the monasteries and the monks. They turned out the Book of Armagh, the beautiful writing, lettering, mm. and as well as that beautiful churches. And I lived there in Glendalough, and it was heaven. I thought it was nothing more, more beautiful. Terrible poor country. I mean, the, the poverty. You see, being so old, I really saw Ireland at its worst, poverty. Mm. But it was beautiful. The people were so wonderful. Mm. I just loved it from the first moment. Um, I would love to know about your day in the studio. Mm. What happens when you walk in? What is your day yeah. like? Well, in so far, it has changed a little bit. And for a whole year, I didn't go into my studio. Mm. Because my studio was really more or less a sanctuary for me. Yeah. I spent the whole day there. I went into the house. I didn't want any telephone calls. That I ran in, made the sandwich, ate the sandwich in the workshop. It was really like that. Yeah. And I really loved all my work. All these years getting commissions and in between working my own work. So it was really lovely that there is no difference being made between sculpture and furniture. And mm. I love that, in, in Bizon, especially in Josef. Mm. I love it. I love his furniture. I love his chairs. I love his tables. And you see, and I, I'm the same because mm. I do sculpture, but I also work for the church in doing furniture. Mm. I do altars. I do um, baptismal fonts. Ambos, sedilias, all that sort of thing. Yeah. And that means I'm doing furniture too, and there is no difference. I think I'm not very happy when people say, oh, I'm doing art. I think, and also, yes, I'm doing art, and I am an artist. I think all these questions are wrong. You can be a sculptor, you can be a painter, you can be a fresco painter, you can be all sorts of things, but you can't be an artist. An artist is something what you are. Mm. Now, like talking about Joseph's work, beautiful, your first reaction is, God, that is really an artist. I mean, that if yeah. I feel that. Yeah. But I think to say that I'm making art, that's impossible. Mm. You can't say that. So it's not a profession, it's something somebody sees. No, it's sees, not a profession. Something somebody it's, sees in it's, you. Exactly. I wanted to ask about just one specific work yeah. of yours, Imogen, a very important one, which is now in the President's yeah. House, um, oh, yeah. which is called Pang or Bang, yeah. which is based on a ninth century poem yeah. written, I think, by an Irish monk in Germany, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's about his cat. Yeah. And he comp it's wonderful to read if you go online. He's comparing the cat hunting for mice to his own work as a writer, as a scribe, yeah. and trying to find the right word. 
a very beautiful, funny poem from over a thousand years ago, mm -hmm. and you made a sculpture based on yeah, it. Yeah, I did. I and Panga born my cat. Tis a like task we are at. Hunting mice is his delight. Hunting words, I sit all night. <laughs> and there are six verses, eight, I think, all together. And a beautiful poem. And that's early Irish poetry. Mm. They wrote, the monks wrote on the margin of their manuscripts, psalms and so on. They wrote because they were bored, always the same thing, <laughs> writing <laughs> always the same things. They wrote on the margin in Irish. Now, mm. Pankerborn, that poem is written in Irish. They wrote all on the margins poems. Mm. I mean, they were, they were so adventurous. I just love these. The early, early Irish art for me is the most wonderful thing what you can mm. imagine. I had some friends and they managed to get Pankerborn into UCD, oh. which was mm. great. All the students, they could sit down and did their studies. You see, I always like to make my sculpture also useful. That means they could sit down. There was seating mm. included in the sculpture arrangement. And, and then, of course, after a few years, suddenly I was told, only then I was told, um, Pankerborn had to go out. He lives now he's in the basement, in storage, and in the Newman house. There's uh, Cardinal mm. Newman's house. The, you might, that's a beautiful uh, building. And he went, the whole Pangaborn went into storage. Now, this was really the end. That was really the end. Mm. And I, every time I met somebody of importance, I bothered them with Panga Born. What can to be done with Panga Born? And so I bothered also the president's wife. <laughs> Our president is a wonderful man and his wife also. They're very special. And so I talked to her and then we invited her as she helped me with all these things. We had her for tea. The two of them came. They thought I had the whole group, but I only had a maquette of about one inch, two foot or so. Mm. I, had a, I had a maquette. Well, they weren't too disappointed. The next thing is they commissioned, they asked UCD, uh, yeah. they asked, could they borrow it? Borrow it. <laughs> that was a very wise thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, they were so delighted about it. I mean, the, uh, the president was really deeply involved. Yeah. He loved the scalloping. I told you about scalloping in Berlin uh, from the students there. Mm. And um, they were so delighted that they had the OPW, that the Office of Public Works. They got it out. They didn't have to repair it like it was pitch pine, but it needs waxing and doing up a bit. Hmm. And it lives now in a special place right beside the president's place, the Aras, what you call the Aras, the hmm. building hmm. where he lives. So I couldn't be happier. Well, I'm very fortunate. Most people, even people, people who did visual things, which you can touch and handle, hmm. um, they are surviving. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that is a wonderful thing. And not everybody is in that condition. So, I mean, I only survived through my stele or public work in churches mm. or wherever it is. Mm. I'm really lucky. I'm really lucky. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We now have the pleasure of hearing from Sheila O'Donnell and John Toomey, uh, who will be known to many of you. Uh, an incredible uh, uh, and powerful combination of minds and creative talents uh, who have brought their 
um, brought their inventiveness here to Joseph Walsh's studio in the new passage house that you'll have all seen outside. Uh, I want to go back um, in our lives to where it all started. And our very first project, our very first structure was a temporary structure uh, erected for the opening of the Irish Museum of Modern Art in 1991. Um, and isn't it strange to be here today opening another not temporary structure? <laughs> um, but there are sort of similarities about the event. A lot of the people in this picture might be here, at least we're here. Um, but what this thing was about was making a space for the paintings of Brian McGuire. And it was uh, to house his paintings in a kind of temporary gallery. And my mistake when I started working on this was I was thinking about passage, about the space as a passage through. And I had it designed and drawn and everything with doors opposite doors and windows opposite windows and stairs opposite ramps. And then Brian pointed out to me that if they're all going through it all the time, when are they going to see the paintings? And it was like first correction, you know. In a gallery, you need a wall with a painting, you need to stop. So I learned so much about passage to do with pause from that experience. But it has this feeling, I think it has this sympathetic feeling with the, I'm pointing to Joseph because it has this sympathetic feeling, I think, with the thing we've done here together, still about character, presence, um, something disruptive, but something belonging. These two photographs are of, um, on your right, the Irish Film Centre, which was one of our, which was our first public project. And on your left, the Central European University in Budapest, one of our most recent projects. And what these are both projects that were to do with reuse and transformation of existing historic buildings. And that has been something that's happened throughout our career. We've occasionally had the uh, a privilege of working with old buildings, and there's so much to learn from that. You learn a lot about material, about presence, about existing character, and in a way your, ch your, your role then is to work with that and to enhance it and to neither embarrass the old building nor kind of outshine it in any way. But also it gives, old buildings often have these peculiar idiosyncratic spaces and corners, so it also gives us a chance to think about that sense of pause and movement. And very often these are both spaces of movement, the entrance hall to the film centre and stairs in the university. But I think also working with these buildings made us acutely aware very early in our career that the old buildings are not in the past, they're in the present. And when we work in an old building, both the old and the new stuff that you do to it coexist in the uh, continuous present. I suppose this theme has come up a lot today, but I think we would always say, you know, the Pantheon and our buildings exist in the same time, which is now. Uh, so I think that's really important, that the past isn't some kind of um, crusty thing that we're trying to preserve in some way. And I think you can learn an awful lot by walking around cities and by observing and actually seeing what time and people have done to places. And I love these two photographs. The one on the left is the Portico da Tavia in Rome. And the one on the right is a moment in Dublin of a temporary market set up under a glass roof beside the Hapney Bridge. And in a way, they both say to me something about theatre, about moment in time, but about moments in time that can only happen because the old things that are in the background facilitate them. So the Portico da Tavia used to be an ancient set of um, temples, then it became a market, then it went through lots of different uses, and now is a funny little taverna behind a plastic curtain. But to me in this photograph, where also the ground level has changed over the centuries, the presence of the man in the coat, the bicycle, the plastic curtain, are, and the light, the way the light comes into it, are all things that make a moment of theatre that you had to be there to experience, but which will keep happening in different ways. And the same thing really applies to the moment where the Hapney Bridge at an angle sets a kind of backdrop for this, just this moment where somebody starts selling stuff off the back of a truck. And I think we are trying in our work to achieve the kind of qualities that these places have, which are, you might say, incidental and momentary. We talked a bit last night about, the, about compression and expansion and, the, and that we really want to make buildings where you're, you're in a narrow space, which then makes you appreciate a big space. And Venice, I mean, we, we've, we've been to Venice so many times and always just walk the streets and the 
Calais and think about the way space works. And this photograph is taken just towards the end of the 10 minute walk from the Academia to the Frari, maybe the most walked tourist route in Venice. And everybody who walks on that route is walking down towards a dead end. And then at the last minute, you turn left through a, a, a 900 millimeter wide gap. And it doesn't feel weird, everyone, that's fine, it's Venice. And then you go through that gap and you can just about see the huge brick church of the Ferrari opens in this space in front of you. And so we, again, these are, I mean, these are observations of things that we would just like to try to reproduce in the work that we are making. One of the high points of this whole bloody business today is being in the presence of valsaki san and hearing the discussion about Ma, you know, about the, the space between I mean, maybe between two characters, but um, in the thickness of the in-between. And actually, that's what we've come to talk about here today. So in the, in the gallery we built in, in Cork, in the Glucksmann Gallery, there's the gallery, and there's a cafe, and there's a stone ground, but the real action happens in that passage space between the floating vessel and the anchored ground. Or in the academic hub, which is to translate that, that's what you used to call a library. In the academic hub we're making in Grange Gorman, the, the pocket spaces that, that are being made between the new buildings and the old buildings, the in-between spaces, are the heart of the, of the principle of the project. So about, uh, about 10 years ago, maybe more, we finished a building in Derry, um, which is a gathering house, uh, a gathering place for Irish music and Irish language. But it was on the most restricted site you can imagine because it only had a narrow street frontage and then walls all the way around on all other three sides. You know, a 55 meter deep site with, only, with a door only on its narrow end. So the thought here was to start in the middle, to work your way out from the inside. Uh, so not to think you were trapped in this narrow site, but rather to think that the project began from the inside. And to make that into a reality, we had to work with this idea of the thickening of the... The walls are containing you, thicken them up to make the space in the centre feel free of containment. We're now designing this museum for the v &A in London, and I'm working on the idea that the skin of the building can be thickened up so that people can pass through the thickness of the skin, if you like, in the ma space between the jacket and the body that can be the spaces of passage for the museum goers. But it was only putting these slides together that I realized it's just the same idea we had in Derry 15 years ago, <laughs> turned inside out. So don't ever throw out an idea. Um, and these are the sketches that I sent to Joseph on the 1st of January, the new year of this year, saying, why don't we build, or rather, why don't we imagine three rambling houses with the walkways in between them, passages in between them, and each one of them sitting in their own pool of sunken stone footprints that are made in the ground, and why don't we try to use thatch in a completely new way in a kind of angular, faceted way um, that, I mean, it was thinking out loud in a conversation with Joseph. That was sent, I drew it over the Christmas holidays, but Joseph's response was, when do we start? Let's get started. <laughs> so we've started, and some of you will have walked through um, the, first, the, the first of our <laughs> rambling houses. Um, and one of the reasons we're at our ease and relaxing here today is because under the tree of the friendship of common purpose between ourselves and, and, the, and Joseph himself and the fierce men who work for Joseph, um, we have made something that you can see is pretty different than the drawing, but is exactly the same as the drawing. And we've made it by saying, do you think so? Do you think so? Can you do that? Can I do that? How do we, you know, um, we've made it by, is it, is it negotiation or? Um, it's collaboration, I think. It's collaboration without getting in each other's way. I want to say, I, I want to say, 
uh, credit to the friendship that has developed and credit to the men who are here in this room who built the thing with us, for whom no question was too hard. What we hope as artists when we, when we create is that something of that feeling, of that energy, of that understanding of life, of that appreciation of life, of that appreciation of shape, that something of that will move out of it and go into the viewer. And that, if that's, that route is successful, then I think that is art. And if that has that effect on thousands of people of all nationalities through centuries, it becomes great art. So when we put our heart and soul into something, whatever it be, whether it be useful, not useful, beautiful, not beautiful, whatever we, whenever we do that, it absorbs our energy and our thoughts and the energy and thoughts of all those people who've made it, which is why the passageway outside is such a triumph. Yeah.